Welcome to Woodman. Regardless of where you're viewing today, no matter your circumstances, we're so glad you've made it a priority to worship with us this week. We're trusting that God will be present with each one of us as we spend time learning and lifting up his name. Later in our service, Pastor Josh will be sharing a message in our teaching series called Undivided. We're going verse by verse through the opening chapters of the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. And in today's passage, we'll take a look at the wisdom the Apostle Paul offers to Christ followers who were getting all caught up in rivalries and disagreements that were undermining God's calling for his church. And at Woodman, as we continue to seek unity in Christ, I'm excited to see what God has for us as we study his word today. We also want to be a church that's living and serving in community, and we're here to get, give you a couple ways how we can help you get involved in the weeks ahead. You can donate non-perishable food items for those in need. At our Woodman Heights campus, you can drop off food in the atrium, which we're really excited about that food pantry. And at Rock Rimmon, you can drop off your donation inside the prayer chapel. Visit us on the web to find the list of the most needed items, along with the days and the hours that are of our availability. And if you attend an on-campus huddle or community group, look for the feeding families bin that you can leave your donations as you head into your groups. Fall community groups and huddles are forming now, and you can sign up now to commit to community in the months ahead. We know that God designed us to walk life and belonging with others, and so we're making community a priority this fall, and we hope you will too. As we begin our time of worship, let's take a moment now in prayer to center our hearts on Christ, the one who unites us and redeems us, the one who is worthy of our praise today and every day. So let's pray together. Lord, we are so grateful that it is through Christ that we have that common bond in you. That no matter what differences we may have, Lord, that we can come together and be one united front for you and for who you are and for your mission. That we can be about what you're about in this church to reach this community. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just open our hearts to you, to whatever you would have to speak to us, to bring us together, Lord, to open our hearts to how we can make an impact and be a light into this community. So, Lord, be with us now. We just look forward to worshiping your name in your name. Amen. Jesus Christ is Lord. 
I appeal to you, brothers, and by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. And what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Well, hello, Woodman. If you are new, my name is Josh, and I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, let me just lend my voice uh, to our welcome and just tell you how legitimately thankful uh, we are that you've chosen uh, to spend some time with us. You know, one of the questions that I struggle to answer is really any variation of the what is your favorite or what is your best uh, line of inquiry. Uh, what, what's your favorite food, Josh? Man, I, I, I like a lot of food. <laughs> you know, what, what, when, what, what was your best vacation? I mean, whether as a kid or as an adult, I love to vacate. I ha I've had a ton of fun. I, I don't know if I could narrow it down to just one. What's your favorite band? I don't know. Now, some of them, obviously. Who's your favorite wife? Mine, mine, mine is. Kimberly is. I have that one down easy. But who's your favorite child? How do I, how do I pick be between them? My parents could. <laughs> it was my sister, Rebecca. But I digress. So I've told you I don't like that line of questioning, but let, let me just do the same thing to, to you. Um, and, and maybe don't answer this out loud, especially if you're in a huddle with other people. What is your favorite thing to do? What's your favorite thing to do? Now, how many of us do you think just said in our heads, share the gospel? If in, in some weird way the Apostle Paul was watching our service, he would have just raised his hand and said, I, I, I did. I, I, I did. For the Apostle Paul, the gospel, the glorious good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we can be forgiven our sins and reconciled to the God who made us. To share that news, that was Paul's favorite thing to do. And he had done a lot of stuff. He had done a lot of things. He had done, he had a lot of experiences. He was knowledgeable and could speak 
on a lot of topics. But his favorite thing, the thing that he lived for, was to share the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you? We began this series entitled Undivided, looking at the New Testament letter of 1 Corinthians. And 1 Corinthians was written by Paul, and it was written to a church that he had started. And he had a lot of love for them. Last week, we looked at the beginning of chapter 1 and saw Paul's overflowing, generous thanksgiving for the Corinthians. These were people he cared about. Unfortunately, these were people who'd begun to lose their way. They, they were separating. They were going in different directions. And Paul writes 1 Corinthians in part to get them back together, to remind them of their one calling, to go and make disciples of all people. Now, I realize, I realize that we're some 2,000 years removed, and, and I know that we've come a long way in that time. But that one calling to go and make disciples is still very much ours. It is still very much the thing that we should be about. And I'm not here to say that it isn't. But I am here to say that we live in a very divided time. And my fear is, if not careful, we might end up heading somewhere else. So with that, let me pray. And we will study God's word together. Heavenly Father, it is remarkable to think of everything that's occurred in 2,000 years, all the changes, and yet, Father, to know that as people, we still are at risk of fighting with one another and going after our own thing, and in doing so, lose track of why you've brought us together. God, I pray that you would take your word, that you would speak Speak through me. Help me to make no mistakes. Say things right. Be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have a Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're beginning at verse 10. And this begins with an appeal. It's, it's the appeal he starts with. It says this. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Now, this is the transitional verse. He's come from all his thanksgiving for them, and now he's going to get what is going to really become like sort of the thesis statement uh, for these first four chapters. This is why he's writing, and he's going to spend some time on this subject. And we're going to spend some time on this verse. He wants them undivided. And first, notice this, that it says, I appeal to you. I appeal. He, he doesn't say this as a command. And he could have. Paul, we read in verse 1, was an apostle. That is, he had authority. We know that Paul started the church in Corinth. So, so he had influence and yet he stops short of making it a command and instead appeals to them. Why? Well, I think most of us would agree it's hard to be commanded to get along with somebody if you're not. A little fight in your marriage, just get over it. Just be nice. It, it, it's difficult. We have, as I said, three sons. And we have had our fair share of little spats between them. And it's hard to say, get over it. So I appeal. I'm like, hey, be a good brother. Love the other. We have these phrases. We, 
we talk about something that isn't yet, but maybe could be. You guys can be tight. Paul is starting off soft. He's walking into this carefully. And secondly, it is an appeal to people he loves. The Greek word translated brothers there is not maybe the best. If you're following along in the NIV, there it says brothers and sisters. Uh, Because the Greek word there, depending on context, can mean either brothers or it can mean brothers and sisters. And here, Paul is using it to speak to the whole church, brothers and sisters. It's a word that he used often to describe Christians and the relationship we should have between one another. (laughs) What's wild is of all the times in the New Testament the Apostle Paul uses that word, he uses it 29% of the time in 1 Corinthians alone. He is going to say some heavy things. And he wants it to come from this this place of relationship and love. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. (laughs) But then he just kind of throws in, it's not just his idea, is it? By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. (laughs) Which by putting that in, sort of kind of does modify the first two. Um, Paul might be appealing, and he's calling you brothers and sisters, but this is what Jesus wants. This is his heart. Our Lord prayed for this. And what is the appeal? It's that we would be undivided that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. What's sort of missed in the English translation is when Paul says that all of you agree, in the Greek, it's literally speak with the same voice, speak with the same words. And that doesn't really make it in English because we know people could say the same thing but inside mean different. What Paul is getting at is that we should agree. So you have here same words, same mind, same judgment, same, same. For almost a decade now, I have served annually at this conference in Thailand. And Thailand sort of known for a lot of its night markets and um, alternative things that you can purchase. And one of the things you routinely hear as you walk up and down those aisles, you you hear shopkeepers saying, same, 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 same. So if I were to walk up with a pair of Ray-Bans that maybe I purchased here for $100 and then saw a similar looking pair and said, hey, are are those Ray-Bans? Same, 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 same. It's just that those cost, you know, $4. And what the Thai people mean by it is sort of like, uh, same, same, but but different. Same, but, but, but a little different. The Apostle Paul is not here calling for uniformity amongst us all. Paul here is not calling for us to disregard our individuality. We're different. But there should be something same, same between us. He is calling for unity. That we would all agree with one another. Same words as to what is most important. That there would be no divisions among us. And the word for division there is used in the New Testament sometimes to to speak of a tear in fabric where it's torn and now going in different ways. The Apostle John used that word divisions to speak of different groups of people and their various views of who Jesus was. They were divided. They did not say the same thing about him. He calls for us to be united in mind and judgment. And that word united is unique because it often was used in a medical context. A bone that is broken needs to be set so it can heal. It's the same word there. It's not just that there exist divisions, but we are to be united. What is fractured should be reconciled. What is broken 
should be restored. We need to get together on this stuff. Many things might separate us, but this one thing brings us all together. You know some of the people who readily understand this? <laughs> it's those who serve in our military or, or have in the past served. It, it, our forces are, are made up of so many different kinds of people, and you've probably served alongside fellow citizens that, that are a little different. I mean, he's from Alabama. He's a little country. Uh, he's from California. A little laid-back surfer guy right there, yeah, that's for sure. She's from Connecticut. A little stuffy. But when you put on the uniform, you all march under the same flag. You all head the same direction. And those things that had divided you are now not as important as the thing that brought you together. Jesus wants that for his church. Unique people with different gifts going the same direction, undivided, same, same, but different. Men and women, different, created by God, distinctly different, but in the church, headed the same way. We have different talents, different skills, different gifts. Some of us are up front, some behind the scenes, some can sing, some good at math, but in the church, all going the same direction, undivided. Whether it be the color of our skin, the size of our home, or even Broncos or Raiders. In the church, going the same direction, undivided. Do you agree What do you think would be a good cause for division? That was the problem for the Corinthians. They were choosing poorly. We get to the problem. Look at verse 11. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. A reported, when, when, when the word reported there is not simply like I heard this. It, it, it's, not, it's, it's not just like, couldn't just be hearsay or gossip. The word reported means uh, to show. It was made clear. It was, it was revealed. It's happening. This has been reported to Paul. By who? Chloe. Chloe's people. And who is Chloe and her people? We're not sure. We can't say for certain. This is the only place she shows up. But so, so, so let's just, let's say she's a businesswoman in Ephesus. And, and she has business in Corinth a lot. And so she sends her people. The sales and marketing folk go down to Corinth often. And they come back from one trip. And they meet up with Paul, they're in a pub, and they're like, have you heard what's going on in the church at Corinth? Dude, it's a crazy town there. And they retell, and it's revealed to Paul what is going on. Paul says there's quarreling among you. And the Apostle Paul is the only one to use that word in the New Testament. And it's, it's not really a nice word. It often finds its place on vice lists, the lists of things we shouldn't be doing. When we get to chapter 3, he uses it alongside the word jealousy, quarreling and jealousy. You could just say it's not good. It's not, it's not a good thing. And what was the quarrel? What was the problem? He says, what I mean, verse 12, is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. 
What's their problem? Their problem is that party spirit, party spirit had taken over the church. They'd begun to boast in different men, and they started to form these little factions depending on who people were aligning themselves with. Does that sound familiar? Some were aligning themselves with Paul, the founder of their church. Some were aligning themselves with Apollos, that eloquent, awesome preacher from Alexandria. We studied his story in Acts 18 not too long ago. Some were following Cephas. That is the apostle Peter. And some, with upturned noses and disdain for others, claim to be following only Christ. We don't listen to any person. And why is this so serious to Paul? It's because it wasn't theology, but affinity and preference that was causing the separation. I mean, if there were only two groups, and one group held up the name of Jesus Christ as Son of God, fully man, fully God, who died and gave his life for the forgiveness of sin, and, and another group that said he, he was a sort of a little insane, self-absorbed peasant, who was murdered for his, he was executed for his crimes. That's it. If that was the division, Apostle Paul would have no problem saying, you need to be in, in this group. And, as we'll see, he would have no problem saying, and this group needs to go. They need to leave. But that, that isn't what's happening here. This was about affinity, personal preference. I follow Paul. He started this church. His blood and sweat are in this church. That counts for something. Well, yeah, I follow Apollos. If we want this thing to grow, we need to get a good preacher in here. And let's be honest, that is not Paul. You know, I follow Cephas. I follow Peter. Do you, he actually walked with Jesus. He lived with Jesus. Let's not take the other guy's word for it. He was there. Well, I don't listen to any person. I follow Jesus and Jesus alone, and he tells me what I need to know. I'm not listening to you. This is not good. Listen. Listen. In an effort, <laughs> in an effort to reduce any spicy emails I might receive this week, I'm not going to say anything very specific. I want to keep this very general. But do you think all the quarrels and divisions that exist among us are all for a good reason? Maybe I say it this way. Do you think the Apostle Paul would want to write us a letter? The problem was the division was not for theological reasons. It was for foolish ones. This is the foolishness of it. Verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He's starting to get a little hot here. And, and he throws out these rhetorical questions that he's not really expecting them to raise their hands and answer, right? Was, was Jesus Christ divided? And the word there isn't just split up. It, it's split up and handed out, like you could break up something and give everybody a little piece. He's like, is that what Jesus did? Do you have your little bit of Jesus over there and you got your little bit of Jesus? Is that, was Christ divided in that way? Was I crucified for you, Paul says? Remind me again. Was it I that was crucified for you? No. It was Jesus. 
Why would you say you follow me? And were you baptized in my name? Let me see, how did it go? I baptized you in the name of Paul. No, no, that's not what we did either. No, you were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Into Christ's name, you were baptized. And then he gets really sort of feisty. And you can tell he's not using like word or pages here. He goes on, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. The division is so strong that Paul, sitting back in Ephesus and thinking of them, is like, I thank God I didn't baptize any more of these people. He's like, I baptized Crispus. I baptized Gaius. But I didn't baptize anyone else. And then maybe it's Sosthenes who's with him when he's writing. Maybe Sosthenes is actually the guy writing it down. Maybe he raises his hand and says, didn't you also baptize Stephanus and his family? And Paul's like, okay, yes, I also baptized them, but I don't know anyone else. And there's no backspace delete. So just put it in there. Is Paul anti-baptism? Not at all. He is pro-baptism. He's for baptism. But he does think it's crazy if somebody thinks they're special because Paul baptized them. What difference does that make? (laughs) And Paul thinks it's especially not so for someone to look down on another person who was baptized if it was someone different doing the dunking. I want to say this lovingly, and I say it not just to you, I say it to myself. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in this. But heaven, heaven does not care about everything we fight about. And I think, I think some of us actually look forward to getting there so that we can be justified for the stands that we took. And clearly, in some cases, we will be. There are stands that we take that we must not back off, and we are rewarded for doing so. But, for some of our other disagreements and arguments... We might get to heaven, and worse than finding out that our opponent was right, we might find out that nobody cares to talk about it at all. Are you crystal clear that the wall of division you are building between you and another brother or sister in Jesus. Are you crystal clear that Jesus wants that wall built? Not everything we fight about matters in heaven. And it's not that we need agree on everything. Not at all. But some disagreements we have, we should be able to be nice about it. We should not be known for what we are against. We should be known for what we are for. And that should be the gospel. And that's what it was for Paul. Look at verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, 
and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And this is insightful for two reasons, right? First, it does give us a little background into the kinds of things they were fighting about. And second, it lets us know what was Paul's favorite thing. The kinds of things that were separating them were personality-driven. Who baptized them? Who was the better preacher? Which, like, as a preacher, and I think most preachers would agree with me, as a preacher, it's so great to know that people thought the Apostle Paul wasn't a great one. That's comforting. Some people liked him, but others are, well, he's not very funny. His illustrations, keeps using the same one. But Paul said, I, I, I didn't come here to have eloquent wisdom. My, 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 my hope wasn't to have you walk out and say, wow, Paul's a great preacher. Paul's hope was people would walk out blown away by the power of God. And that separation between them and the God who made them because of the sin we've all committed could be erased through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's like, I do not want the cross emptied of any power. I don't want people to think, wow, it was a good preach. I want them blown away that their sins can be forgiven and that God loves them. This is what was really important. This was Paul's favorite thing. Christ did not send him to baptize, though Paul did baptize people. Though Paul was a fan of baptism, the thing he was sent to, to do, was to preach the gospel. Not to make it winsome or appealing, not to have people walk out and say, Paul's a really good preacher. But to call men and women, young and old, to repentance by placing their faith in Jesus Christ. That is what he wanted. And he wanted to preach it with confidence. And he believed that God would get it done. We can, we can and should stand for many things. But the one thing he has commanded us all to do is to go make disciples, to go out into the world, to baptize people, to teach them to observe all that Jesus has commanded us to do, and to do so with confidence that he is with us, and will never leave us. This is why we say we want to love well, change lives through Christ. A lot of things we do as a church, a lot of different various ministries having profound impact doing very specific things, but the overall vision is we want to see people's lives changed. through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you want that? We would love to introduce you to him. I can tell you, he loves you very much. That's the message that brings us together. It is our main thing. Is it yours? Do you desire to see people come to faith in Jesus above all else? You know, like many parents, I have, um, I wouldn't say plans for my sons, because that maybe gets a little creepy, but I have, I have dreams. Things that I, as I think in the future, 
things I'd like to see happen. Now, many parents who've gone before me would say that it doesn't always work out that way. You know, for all I know, one of my sons could fall in love with like a cat person and she could make their home into a little feline kingdom. One of my sons, even though I brought him to the foot of the front range, could move to some place like Kansas and want to stay there forever. One of my sons could become a vegetarian. What if they all choose to cheer against the Green Bay Packers? What would we do when we got together? <laughs> and yet, if that cat lady, if that, if that church in Kansas, if that vegetarian, if the whole Packer-hating lot of them desire to see men and women come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, if they share of their heart of the lost being reached, if they talk about the way people are being discipled in the churches that they attend, I don't care about any of it. We have one calling to make disciples. Let's not allow anything to divide us. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the uniqueness that you have assembled in your body, the gifts, talents, skills and affinity. Lord, what a beautiful picture the local church is. Father, you know that it's sometimes hard for us to stick together. Jesus prayed for unity 2,000 years ago, and as much as things have changed, there are still some things that remain the same we can quickly put ourselves at odds with a brother and sister for things that really, in light of eternity, don't matter. God, give us wisdom. And Father, bring us souls. Continue to use this church, the men and women in it, to reach this world for Christ. That is our calling. That is our prayer. In your son's name. Amen.
buried in shame and risen in power. He is alive, and the stone is rolled away. All of worship will belong to Him forever. Death is conquered, and our Savior holds the
dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of all Part of the thing that makes our church fun is actually that we don't agree on everything. But I can say the vast majority of us, we agree on this main thing. And you may be uh, avoiding getting in a huddle or a community group for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but if you're avoiding it because there's going to be people there that are different, but that's okay. There's, there's a lot you can learn from them. There's a lot that you could teach. But, but by and large, they're, they're, they're going to want to encourage you in what it is we want to do, which is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And even if you know you've gotten a little heavy-handed perhaps in the past, you could just say sorry to somebody. You could remind them that you agree on the main thing and that brothers and sisters in Christ, we're spending eternity with each other. We can certainly get through this next few years. So as you go, go with this. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God bless you, and have a great week.